a Portland Community College mathematics telecourse. A course in arithmetic review produced at Portland Community College. Essentially, the main difference between adding and subtracting mixed numbers is that in subtraction, you sometimes need to borrow. In this case, let's take a case where there is no borrowing, just to emphasize that it's the same as addition. Now remember, in addition, we said that essentially you have two problems, a whole number problem and a fraction problem. Let's do the fraction portion first. In order to subtract fractions, the numerators must be the same. So we ask what's the lowest number that 9 and 6 will each divide into, and it's 18. So we build each of these to become 18. So multiplying here by 2, top and bottom, the new top becomes 14, and the bottom, of course, 18. Here, multiplying this by 3, and the top by 3 as well, the new top becomes 3, and the bottom, of course, 18. Then when the denominators are the same, you subtract the tops in this order. This from this, and that's going to be important. This one from this one which gives me 11 eighteenths, then subtract the whole numbers, which gives me 5, 1, and 15, and 11 eighths. And of course, always checking to see if this is reducible. See, it's, that's simple. Essentially, that's what we did with addition, except that we added instead of subtract. But let's look at another one where sometimes this one will not subtract from that one. Here's a problem where we're going to have to do the process called borrowing. But before we do that, we could ask, how did I know ahead of time that I would have to borrow? Essentially, you don't. You just assume that you're not going to borrow. Go ahead and begin your subtraction and see what happens. Again, we ask, what number will each of these divide into evenly? And that is 30. So we build each of those denominators to become 30. In this case, I multiply top and bottom by 2. The bottom becomes 30. The top becomes 8. To build this one to 30, I multiply by 3, both top and bottom, and it becomes 21. Now, in this case, 21 will not subtract from 8. Do not reverse. This must subtract from here. So the question is, what to do? Let's pause for a moment to recall some simple facts. 1 is the same thing as any number. A stands for any number except 0, divided by itself. See more specifically, 8 divided by 8 is simply another way of saying 1. 305 divided by 305 is another way of saying 1. And in our case, specifically, 30 divided by 30 is 1. Now let's see what we're going to do with that fact. Recall that the top was 35 and 4 fifteenths, which after getting common denominators, this became 35 and 8 thirtieths. But I could write that 35 as 34 plus 1. Still 35, and of course, and is plus 8 thirtieths. Same thing, just written differently. Now, I'll leave the 34 alone, but I'll replace the 1 by something that's equal to 1, and that's 30 over 30. And of course, I still have the 8 over 30. Still the same thing, just written differently. Now again, leaving the 34 alone, since these two have common denominators, 
we can add. 30 plus 8 is 38. So this is saying that 35 and 4 fifteenths or 35 and 8 thirtieths may be replaced by 34 and 38 thirtieths. Let's do so. But in replacing this by this, let's note a pattern. If I'm going to replace this by this, this is one smaller. One smaller. If I'm going to replace this 8 thirtieths by 38 thirtieths, notice here, had I taken this denominator and added it to the numerator, 30 plus 8, I would get 38, which is exactly what I want up here. But now notice if I have 38 thirtieths, 21 will subtract from 38. 1 from 8 is 7, 2 from 3 is 1, and indeed I can subtract 21 thirtieths from 38 thirtieths. And now subtracting the whole numbers, 8 from 14 is 6, 1 from 2 is 1, and I'm done. This process of borrowing, in this case, 1 from here, making it to be 30 thirtieths, adding it to this to get a numerator that's large enough so that this numerator will subtract from it, we call borrowing. Now we went through and showed you essentially the logic of it, which can confuse the issue just a trifle. So let's go through another problem mechanically just to get a smooth feel for the mechanical procedure. First we get a common denominator which is 16. In this case to get 16 I multiply top and bottom by 4 and I would have 4 sixteenths subtracting 13 sixteenths. So we start with the assumption that I can subtract, but in this case 13 will not subtract from 4. That tells me to borrow. So we made this one smaller. We're borrowing. We're going to add 16 sixteenths to this, which is the same thing as adding the bottom to the top, which gives me 20. Now 13 will subtract from 20, giving me 7. Now subtracting the whole numbers, we get 5, checking to see if I can reduce this, which I can't, and we're done. Let's review that verbally. A shortcut when you need, when you see that you need to borrow. One, make the whole number one smaller. See, that's what we did. And two, add the value of the denominator to the numerator and that gives you the new numerator. So we added the value of this denominator, 16, to the old numerator, 4, to get a new numerator, 20. Now we can subtract, and furthermore, we always will be able to. Then reduce and subtract the whole numbers. Now let's look at two special but simple cases where one of the fractions is missing. In this case, it's very simple. This is nothing here. It's zero. And zero always subtracts from anything. You could say, using algebraic terminology, anything subtract zero is itself. So three-eighths subtract zero is still three-eighths. Then subtract the whole numbers, and you're done. So that's simple. Just remember, if you don't have a fraction, you have, in effect, zero. And zero from anything is itself, and you're done. Now, this sort of looks the same, except now we're subtracting three-sevenths from zero. And I can't do that. But that's sort of the same thing as saying I have eight and no sevenths. In this case, of thinking it that way, I see that I do have a common denominator of 7, but 3 will not subtract from 0. So I borrow. I make this 1 smaller, add the denominator to the numerator. Now 3 from 7 is 4, 2 from 7 is 5, and I'm done. Or you can think I borrowed 1, and that 1 becomes 7 sevenths. 
that's a cleaner way of looking at it for a more experienced person. Now let's look at two quick problems that might get us ready for, again, algebra or later working with formulas. Some number subtracted by 7 eighths is 1 third. What is that number? Now recall in whole numbers, we said to undo subtraction, you add 5. So adding 5, undoes subtracting 5, leaves you with that number. But adding 5 to the same number as represented by the other side, we had 11. So the secret here was I'm subtracting here, I undo subtracting by adding to both sides. So the secret to our problem, to undo subtracting 7 eighths, I'll add 7 eighths to both sides. This undoes that, giving me x. This side becomes 1 third, adding 7 eighths. Now doing this addition on scratch paper and getting common denominators, which we can see is 24, we get 8 plus 21 is 29 twenty fourths which as a mixed number becomes 1 and 5 24ths. So my variable is 1 and 5 24ths. And of course I did this very rapidly. You might require more time and a bit more scratch work. That's okay. Now let's try this kind of a problem. Some number plus 4 fifths is 9 tenths. The only difference between this problem and this problem is here I'm using simpler numbers and whole numbers. Recall to undo adding, we subtract from both sides. This undoes that, giving me my unknown. And completing the subtraction over here, we have 3. So that gives us a clue up to here. To undo adding 4 fifths, we will subtract 4 fifths from both sides. There. This. Subtracting 4 fifths undoes adding 4 fifths, leaving me to my variable by itself. So now subtracting 4 fifths from 9 tenths, I need common denominators. So my 9 tenths I left alone, and this becomes 8 tenths. 8 tenths from 9 tenths is 1 tenth, and we're done. Now, had we used mixed numbers here instead of fractions, the principle is still the same. To undo addition, you subtract. Whatever the number is, you simply work with that. Just that simple. Now, let's review some common trouble spots for beginners. Interestingly enough, these are not difficult problems. They are problems which are so easy, one can get confused if one isn't truly conscious of what's happening at the moment. For example, be very alert when you're subtracting mixed numbers with only one fraction. Here the difficulty is in not being conscious of which number is being subtracted and which number is subtracting from. So this says I'm trying to subtract 3 eighths from 0. But here I am subtracting 0 from 3 eighths. And of course, I can always subtract 0 from any number, 0 eighths if you wish. 0 from any number is that number. Then of course, the whole numbers. So when you're subtracting the 0, 0 from any number is that number. But when you're subtracting a number from 0, you need to recognize that you can't. And if it will help your thinking, instead of just thinking that you have 0, think that you have 0 eighths. So we do have common denominators, but I can't subtract 3 from 0. So using our borrowing shot, uh, shortcut, we lower this 1, add the denominator to the numerator to get a new numerator. And now we have borrowed, and uh, this is large enough. I can subtract 3 
from the new denominator of 8 and get 5, and of course subtracting the whole numbers. So you have to be very er alert to recognize I can subtract 0 from something, that's just that's something, but I cannot subtract a number from 0. So to do that I must borrow to get a number that I can subtract from. Can you put these two examples into your mind and keep them very, very clean? This is so simple, but in fact it's a very common careless mistake. Another common careless spot for beginners. Do not say in a problem like this that 3 cannot subtract from 1, therefore I guess I'm going to have to borrow. You don't know whether you're going to have to borrow until your denominators are the same. So before you ever borrow, first carry out the chore of getting common denominators, which in this case is 32. This one already is in 30 seconds. But to build this fraction to get that common denominator of 32, I had to multiply top and bottom by 4. Now notice in this case, once my denominators are common, this numerator will subtract from this numerator. 3 from 4 is 1, and of course subtracting my whole numbers gives me 3. Now do you see what you have to be careful about here? If you just look at the numerators alone, one can be led into believing I'm going to have to borrow because you would say to yourself, I can't subtract 3 from 1 without realizing you're not going to subtract until these denominators are the same. And after they become the same, the top numbers, the numerators, of course, become quite different. And at that, that point, it might subtract. Again, it might not, and you might have to end up borrowing. But don't make the decision to borrow or not borrow until denominators are common. If one did not pay attention to this, here is a problem that can make you want to go the other way. Casually looking at just the numerators and forgetting the denominators, you would say, well, gee, I can subtract 5 from 7. But again, don't make that decision until denominators are common. In this case, you can see that the common denominator is going to be the 18. So this one already has denominators of 18. And to build this one to have 18 as a denominator, I multiply top and bottom by 3. And now I realize 15 will not subtract from 7. So in this case, I in fact have to borrow, whereas here you might be led into thinking you didn't. Now we call our shortcut for borrowing. We simply make the whole number portion 1 smaller then add the denominator to the numerator, so 18 added to 7 is 25. And that's the same effect I would get as going through the normal routine of borrowing. You always end up with these results. Furthermore, you will always be able to subtract after you have borrowed. So if you borrow and get to a situation where this will not subtract from this, suspect that you have made a mistake and go back and check it. In this case, 15 from 25 is 10. And then, of course, subtracting the whole number parts to the problem. We're done, except as a common agreement in arithmetic type situations, always remember to reduce fractional answers unless requested to do otherwise. So you can see I could divide top and bottom here by 2 and get 4 and 5 ninths. And it's very frequently the case in adding or subtracting because of reducing 
that you will end with a fraction whose denominator is unlike either one of which you began. So don't let that surprise you. That will happen fairly frequently. Okay. Again, don't attempt to borrow or make the decision to borrow until the denominators are the same. Then if you find you do have to borrow because this numerator will not subtract from this, then our shortcut for borrowing is to make the whole number one smaller and then add the denominator to the numerator to get a new numerator which will work. Then proceed with the problem and remember to check to see if you can reduce fractions. There it is, really in a nutshell, the whole show. Another common trouble spot really has nothing to do with fractions. But let's just proceed with this and you'll see where it is in just a moment. First, recalling what we just said, don't even attempt to add or subtract, let alone borrow, until the denominators are the same. So here again, the denominators are simple enough that we can see that the common denominator is going to be 30. And to build 15 into 30, I need to multiply top and bottom by 2, which gives me 8 thirtieths. And to build 6 into 30, I will need a multiplier of 5, top and bottom, which builds the 5, 6 to 25 thirtieths. Then at this stage, because I can see that the denominators are the same, which is what gives me permission to subtract or add for that matter, I try to subtract this numerator from this. And of course, 25 will not subtract from 8. So that tells me I have to borrow. But if I go all the way over here and make this one smaller, now of course, I can't borrow from 0, so I'm going to have to go up here. I can't borrow from here, so I have to go all the way up to this. In short, you're going to make the number 500 one smaller, which, of course, is the number 499. Then that 1 that you borrowed is going to be added onto 8 thirtieths. But recall our shortcut. You add the denominator to the numerator. And of course, that gives me 38. And we said at this point, this number, the new numerator, will always work. And of course, 25 will subtract from 38 13 times. And in this case, I have a fraction which is reduced. So doing the whole number part of the problem is 3 there, 1 there, and there. So recognize that sometimes in the borrowing process for the fraction, we have to also do a lot of borrowing on the whole number itself in order to get that 1 that we want to add to this fraction. And then also remember, if you are taking this review arithmetic course in order to get ready for algebra, one of your algebra skills will be solving equations. So in this course, we've been reviewing from time to time solving simple algebraic equations, which simply means to isolate that variable on one side of the equation all by itself. And we've been trying to emphasize that you don't think that you just want to get rid of a number in order to isolate this, that you're actually undoing operations, which just happen to, of course, involve that number. So to undo addition of 3 eighths, you must subtract 3 eighths, but you must subtract 3 eighths from both sides of the equation. So subtracting 3 eighths undoes adding 3 eighths, thus isolating the variable, which is what we mean by solving the equation. And of course, finishing the indicated arithmetic on this side, we would get 4 eighths, which reduces to 1 half. But in the second example down here, 
It's not, again, the three eighths I want to get rid of. I want to undo, in this case, subtraction. So you undo subtraction by addition. And of course, what I add to one side of the equation, I must add the same amount to the other side. So over here, the addition of 3 eighths undoes the subtraction, isolating the variable b in this case, and then adding the indicate, doing the indicated addition on this side, we would get 10 eighths, which not only reduces, in this case, to 5 fourths, but if you wish or need to, it changes to the mixed number 1 and 1 fourth. So here again, when you solve the equations, always remember that subtraction undoes addition, addition undoes subtraction, and that when you focus on equations, you focus not on the number, but first on the operation you're trying to undo. Then as a secondary focus, look at the number which is being operated by that addition in this case and subtraction in this case. Is this becoming fairly clear? Cannot possibly tell you how important this is for later courses. And while we're at it, let's just review that if I wish to undo multiplying by a fraction, we learned several lessons ago that that was simply a matter of multiplying by the reciprocal. And of course, multiplying both sides of the equation. So you might say, don't we undo multiplying by dividing? And the answer is yes. If I were to divide by 3 eighths, that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal, wasn't it? So we can shortcut that process and just think to undo multiplying by a fractions, you multiply once again by the reciprocal of the fraction. Because in this case, 8 thirds times its reciprocal is 1 times the variable, which is the same thing as the variable period. And of course, reviewing at the same time, when I'm multiplying, I always check before I multiply to see if there is a possible cancellation process which in this case there is, and that gives me now 5, 6. So, subtraction undoes addition, addition undoes subtraction, and multiplying by a reciprocal undoes multiplying by a fraction. Is it beginning to piece together now? If it isn't, just stay with it, and with more practice, this will all seem in time, and not very much time, to be remarkably simple. This is your math host, Bob Fennell. We'll see you on the next lesson.